Hello, YouTube, and welcome into Com Communication Studies Live Senior Streaming Research Presentations. I'm your host today, Dr. Ryan Stouffer, joined by Dr. Alec Hosterman here. And we are so excited to welcome you for the fourth edition here of our live original student research streaming presentation. So Dr. Hosterman, tell them a little about what your students did for research, please. Our students ended up doing qualitative research. We had students interview 12 subjects and then do a thematic analysis of the interviews in order to discern several themes from their research. But apart from that, our research in the terms of the process was the same as the quantitative. Well, thank you, Dr. Hosterman. My students did quantitative research here, right? So we're looking for large patterns of communication trends. So they all did a survey. Our goal for that was to get 100 responses from our survey. Shout out to the couple of groups. Uh, one group went 500 responses here. Uh, but most of our groups were really successful with gaining that. And so they had some hypotheses. They tested those hypotheses for significant differences. And then, of course, they will share those results today. Sometimes significant, sometimes not. But that's okay, right? This is an introduction to original research, our first time our students are doing this. Uh, so part of the real goals of this class is to have them walk through the entire research process, figure out some of those conclusions, and explain why maybe they were right on some cases or a little incorrect on some other cases here. So of course, this is a live student produced programming as well here too. Uh, so you'll be able to see our lovely Skycam up there. Uh, gives an idea of everybody in the studio. Uh, by the way, sponsorships are still available for Skycam, so feel free to donate. Send the checks to Ryan Stouffer. Uh, and the, also, you'll be able to see our Com Lab. Com 434 is our, the crew behind the scenes today. So we cut to the control room here. They can all wave to you. Uh, they're the ones back there doing all the hard work and making this look good. So this is a really exciting opportunity for me as a media scholar here because I get to show off our students' original research as well as our students' production skills here. So we're going to get started in just a few minutes with our first student presentation. So Dawson and Liam are coming at you shortly. Thank you very much.
Hello, I'm Dawson Wade. And I'm Liam Wells. And we will be presenting our research study on the effects of Instagram use on self-esteem. Research topic. Our study is focused on the effects of Instagram use on self-esteem. Much of the literature existing has suggested that other social media apps such as Facebook may affect self-esteem. We wanted to look into Instagram because we felt there was something missing there. Our hypothesis one stated the less amount of likes someone receives on an Instagram post, the more likely it will have a negative effect on their overall levels of self-esteem. Our second hypothesis stated that people who feel they post inferior content will have lower levels of self-esteem than people who perceive their own content as superior to their peers. The post hoc analysis predicted that those who post on Instagram for the sole purpose of boosting their self-esteem will generally have higher levels of self-esteem compared to those who post for other reasons. So for our methodology, we had 106 active Instagram users ranging from the ages of 18 to 31 years of age. However, only 3.7% of our sample was 25 years or older. 55% uh, were female and 45% were male. Our procedures, we had a 15 question Google survey and the average completion time ranged from one to three minutes. We used a Likert scale for these non-demographic questions as well. And our results showed that our hypothesis one was not significant but approaching significance with a p-value of 0.071. Hypothesis two was significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, 0.001 that is. And our post hoc analysis was significant with a p-value of 0 0.0019. Our first two constructs are comparison to others and self-presentation. Comparison to others is an evaluation or estimate or the similarities or differences between two things. People compare themselves in two ways, upward comparison and downward comparison. Upward comparison refers to when individuals compare themselves to superior others who have positive characteristics. Downward comparison refers to when individuals compare themselves to inferior others who have negative characteristics. We found that individuals who felt they posted inferior content had lower levels of self-esteem. Individuals who felt they posted superior content had higher levels of self-esteem. This suggests that the low self-esteem group was likely doing a lot of upward comparison and the high self-esteem group compared downward. For self-presentation, we did not find this construct to be very present in our results. However, it's still worth mentioning that it may have an effect on self-esteem in, in the way individuals personalize their accounts. Our third construct, which was self-esteem, was our main dependent variable throughout our research study. And self-esteem refers to how individuals value and perceive themselves. Our results showed that the self-esteem of Instagram users were affected by the perception of their own content. In addition, however, they were not affected by the amount of likes they received per post, which was something that we found surprising throughout our study. And our fourth and final uh, construct, which was affirmation, refers to a sense of assurance or encouragement one feels from a certain action being affirmed. In reference to the uses and gratification theory, people have a need for certain satis uh, satisfactions and seek certain media outlets to um, have those satisfactions met. And our post hoc analysis showed that the users who post on Instagram to boost their self-esteem actually did have higher levels of self-esteem from those actions being reaffirmed. Some of our key takeaways include the number of likes received per post did not generally have an effect on self-esteem. People who view their content as inferior generally had lower levels of self-esteem. 22% of females were likely to delete a post that did not perform to their expectations, whereas only 10% of males said the same. This is seen on the top graph of the slide. 55% uh, of people with private accounts were satisfied with their content, whereas 51.2% of people with public accounts were satisfied with their content. And this is shown on the bottom graph of the slide. Some of our limitations include our sample size. We only had 106 individuals participate in our survey, which was a somewhat small sample. Uh, more responses would help us develop a better conclusion. And for our survey, we used the Likert scale. Uh, and some of these responses could be inaccurate based on different individual values differing from person to person. And our variable measurement, people did not really answer the questions as consistently we, as we would have liked. Uh, we originally had 116 survey responses, but had to omit 10 for various reasons, such as incomplete responses, misleading answers, um, and extreme outliers in age. Future research, uh, larger sample from students currently in college, and then compare, we could compare results from non-college students. A larger sample could give better results overall and reveal a more accurate look at the population. Uh, for different demographics that may have a very different outcome on 
how those are those individuals are affected uh, by Instagram usage and their self-esteem. For the experimental method, uh, incorporating open open-ended questions could be beneficial, as our study was purely composed of closed questions. We also thought that a longitudinal study design following individuals' Instagram usage over time and its effects on self-esteem would be would provide new insights. And in conclusion, uh, we did find that people are affected, their self-esteem is affected through Instagram use, and it does provide opportunities for further research that would be worth looking into in the future. Um, so Dawson and I would like to thank you all for listening to our presentation, The Effects of Instagram Use on Self-Esteem. Hello, my name is Channing Fisher. And I'm Cassie Barber. And today we are talking about our research project, analyzing different slang between generations W, Y, and Z. Our research topic was based on generational differences of baby boomers, millennials, and Generation Z. Our study worked to understand the differences in slang between these generations and how that impacted communication intergenerationally. We found a gap in research concerning the generational gap between these specific demographics. Our research questions were, what is the difference between the slang that generation W, Y, and Z use, and how does the difference between generations W, Y, and Z impact their ability to communicate? The demographics we chose were the baby boomers generation, millennials, and generation Z. We recruited through Facebook as well as word of mouth 
We conducted 12 interviews in a total with an average length of 20 minutes each. We transcribed the data using an app called Otter. To analyze this data, we focused on repetition, keywords, and forcefulness. We noticed that when asked what slang baby boomers used, they could not recall. We suggest that this means baby boomer slang use com uses common language rather than baby boomer slang. As an example of this from, an, from a participant who said, I wish I could have, quote, I wish I could have read these questions earlier so I had time to prepare, end quote. We, no we also noticed that all of our millennial participants stated they learned slang through their younger peers and online. One participant stated they learned it through their students and on social media. This shed light on how Generation Z and Millennials were communicating. Lastly, we found that Generation Z participants all held similar views on when and where slang usage was appropriate. One stated they did not see it being appropriate around adults or in a professional setting. This speaks to the code switching Generation Z partakes in to be taken more seriously as well as being better understood. Our research suggested that communication between members of the same generation functions differently than communication between people in two or more generations. Communication between generations, especially millennials and Generation Z, is used as a ground for learning and understanding one another. As well as our participants' altered slang usage, when speaking with people outside of their generation in an attempt to be more easily understood. We saw that our participants represented their generational want of trying to gain understanding of other generations. We also saw that many participants respected generational differences as a new culture to learn about and understand. Instead of pushing away the new, we suggest that generations want to learn more about their counterparts. We also found that generations are using different slang words to represent a similar concept. An example of this would be a baby boomer generation saying, that's my bad, while a Generation Z would say, my B. It's taking a new angle at the same or similar concept. We found limitations in the sex of our interviewees and the ability to recall their slang usage. We were able to find two males to interview and ten females disproportionately representing that female perspective. We also believe that given more time, the participants would be able to remember more slang they use. For future research, we recommend using a focus group rather than interviewing participants. This would give researchers first-hand access to watching different generations communicate in real time. It would also remedy their ability to remember slang by being able to bounce off of one another. We would also recommend using different questions for different generations to have a more specific understanding of their generational specificities. Lastly, we would include more about how participants of each generation learn slang. Thank you so much for tuning into our research today. We hope you learned more about generational differences and similarities involving slang and communication. Thank you. I've been wrong before I was waiting in the undertow Set a drift with featherway light bulbs Unaware of where my heart was oh, I was waiting in the undertow
Hello, my name is Araya Godfrey, and I'm here talking about the influence of social media on slacktivism and activism. Thank you for your time. Slacktivism would be considered what is the downplayed version of activism. It's what's online, like petition, signing of articles or saying you'd attend a protest but not actually attending the protest. While activism is the actual action of, activ of activism, protests, marches, um, going to Congress and speaking, all of that is the general idea of what my, pro my connection between age and how it influences a uh, activism. Now, I did research on the connection between social media and activism and if age had any kind of play in it as well as race. Now, with my hypothesis, I had millennials and Gen Z engaging in slacktivism more than those who are the older generations. Then I had a research question if direct involvement in the movement would hire, have a higher range of engagement than those who had no direct involvement with the organization or cause. Now another question that came up was if petitions will be signed more than donations between any range or race. And with that, I'm going to move on to how this happened. With the participants, I had the ranges of anyone over the age of 18, and nationalities were open to everybody. But I was exclusively looking for social media users, and 103 participants were involved, and 103 participants were used. All of them using a range of social media from Facebook, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, 
And the procedures had been a five-minute survey with sample questions of how much have you donated over three years to an organization, or how many protests have you attended within three years, or how often do a post on social justice movements appear in your social media platforms. Now, with that, the results came for the first hypothesis with um, a significance over 0.05 as a, seemed to be a range between how people tend to donate based on their ages, as well as a significance between people from races and on, um, who are involved in a cause directly versus people who weren't involved in a cause directly. And there was no significance within people who attended marches or protests or signed a petition versus people who did not, and they were donating more. Now, the results supported that there was a higher amount of slack, um, slacktivism participants within the generations. Now, with the older generation, when donating, they tended to donate more money. However, the younger generation tended to date, donate more often. And with the, support in, with the support of who was being affected by the organization and their cause, there seemed to be more people directly involved supporting online and through activism rather than people who were not directly involved. Now, there seemed to be an influence on people attending or knowing about protests based on finding out information from social media, whether it be a shared post or a um, actual ad for the um, event itself. Now, the younger generation tended to have more participation, participation in slacktivism than the older generation, and they seem to follow more of the trends doing TikTok vid uh, videos, like supporting of movements, as well as hashtags like BLM or Me Too. But this is important research because this could expand the way social movements are done in the future. As if technology is increasing, people are going to be online more often. So what's the next logical step? Social media movements. And it could encourage more outwardly activism as well. It could introduce movements that wouldn't be otherwise known to the world, as well as recognize the efforts of social movements that people wouldn't know about had it not been placed on a social media outlet. Now, the limitations I had was that I had a small demographic, and if I knew that some of the questions would be um, concerning um, their location and their age, I would have rephrased them differently, but there was no way to know that they, there would be a disconnect there, as well as I had another part of my research where I wanted to look at international responses and compare them to American responses, but I did not get that many, so that was also a limitation there. And for future research, I believe it could do better with a larger sample size, as well as a different location, different locations at the same time, comparing them within their own countries or comparing them to other countries. And I think another good research would be to have people track how many social movement posts they do, as well as look at how many social movement posts come up on their pages while they are actively using social media and compare it to how often they participate in activism. Thank you so much. My name is Rai Godfrey, and I hope this research would actually go further on than where I was able to get to. Thank you.
escapes askew Stuck inside at noon Out where the stars forget to shine How far you'd fall Were you to call Hold your breath, it'll all be over soon Stuck inside this cage that's built for you Stuck inside this cage that can't fit to Good afternoon. I'm Dylan Eagle. And I'm Shana Underwood. And we conducted research on how different generations of people perceive tattoos and piercings, specifically in the workplace. Tattoos and piercings are now extremely common or more socially acceptable, but a negative stigma surrounding them still remains. There's past research on how different generations of people perceive tattoos and piercings, but not in the workplace or varying work industries. The questions that guided our research were, how do different generations of people perceive tattoos and piercings, and how do dif different generations of people believe tattoos and piercings play a role in the ability of getting a job? So in collecting our data, we conducted a total of 12 interviews. Six of the interviewees were male and six were female. The four generations of individuals analyzed were Baby Boomer, Gen X, Millennial, and Gen Z. And three participants from each of the four generations were represented. We recruited these individuals through social media apps such as Facebook, word of mouth, and then through forms of digital communication such as email and text. For the procedures, again, we conducted 12 interviews, uh, both in person and on Zoom, and we recorded the information for the interviews conducted in person on an app called Otter, which not only recorded the audio, but also transcribed it. And for the interviews done on Zoom, we had Zoom transcribe it. We collected our data through a thematic analysis, and the themes developed were using repetition, keywords, and forcefulness. We found a few common themes, one being the placement of tattoos and piercings. Out of all the participants, we had no positive opinions on face or neck tattoos, and majority also shared they disliked gauges and septum piercings. One participant said they become distracting and kind of makes it difficult to communicate. This is relevant as the placement and or size of somebody's body modification may play a role in how they are perceived by people. We also found that fact the, uh, another common theme we found is the factors that influence the decision to not get tattoos or piercings. There were three overlapping re reasons being the stigma of tattoos, the pain factor, and future regret. One participant said, I think people are willing to put anything on their body that I don't think they realize they're going to have for the rest of their life. This is also relevant as the participants did not express a disapproval of tattoos or piercings, but shared why they personally do not have them. Another common theme we found was the similarities between the sexes. No males had piercings, yet four out of the six had tattoos. All of the females did have piercings, yet only two had tattoos. One of our interviewees said, quote, I notice piercings more when they're on men and tattoos more when they're on women. It is possibly due to tattoos being more common on males and piercings on females. We found this to be relevant as the gender of an individual may play a role in how their tattoo or their body modifications rather are perceived. The final theme we found was expression and symbolism. This was very common among the interviewees as many of them would say that tattoos and piercings were a good form of expression for those who have them and that they also carry some sort of symbolism in some way. One of our interviewees said, quote, I think that tattoos are a great way for someone to express who they are and can be very therapeutic. 
We found this to be relevant as one reason we found people have become more accepting of tattoos and piercings as the years have gone on is because they realize that they are used as forms of expression or carry some sort of symbolic meaning. For our discussion, we found that different generations of people do perceive tattoos and piercings differently. Though no participants share they do not approve of tattoos or piercings, we found older generations of people perceive the body modifications more in a negative way than the younger generations do. We initially believed this would be true as the older generations grew up in a time when tattoos and piercings were very negatively perceived. Older generations we interviewed have a combined total of four tattoos and piercings, while the younger generations have 48. We did not find any significant evidence that they believe tattoos and piercings play a role in the, in the ability of getting a job unless they're placed on the face, neck, hands, or are overly distracting. Only two out of 12 participants had no body modifications, which we believe suggests that it's actually more common to have them than to not have any. Piercings were also found to be more accepted than tattoos. We did have a couple limitations, one being the limited number of participants. We only had three participants from each generation, which cannot represent an entire one. We also conducted interviews via Zoom and in person, which may, so we may have more in-depth information from some than others. We also had no male Generation Z participants and an unequal ratio of sex between generations. For future research, we conducted three interviews with people who had previously been in the military. Two out of the three of them, both males, said they had tattoos to represent their time served. We suggest future research on how body modification regulations have evolved in the military and also suggest to include female representation. In terms of varying work industries, a few interviewees say their opinions on body modifications would differ in different types of work industries other than their own, and for that reason we suggest more information on people's perception of body modifications in various work industries and again, that'll be very beneficial. And finally, uh, higher education. We also interviewed several people who work in higher education. All of them said that they never had to disclose whether they had a tattoo or piercing in a job interview and were not asked to cover it up on the job. And again, we suggest future research on the perception of body modifications in places of higher education. Thank you for tuning in to watch our research and thank you to Dr. Hosterman.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nick Robinson, and I'm here to talk to you about my research on politics and news trust. So my research topic, I conducted my research via a survey of college-age students ages 18 to 23 to test their political affiliations as well as their trust in mainstream news. Um, one research gap that I would have liked to have looked in before but could not find enough information on was um, young people's thoughts on the 2020 election, given how controversial that was. Um, my first hypothesis was that young people would align their views of politically charged news networks like CNN and Fox News with their political <coughs> affiliation. Like someone who was liberal would have a higher trust in CNN than someone who is conservative. Hypothesis two, I said that people who consume more news would have a higher level of trust than people who consumed less. For the methodology, as mentioned before, my survey was sent out to adults ages 18 to 23. I sent the link to my classmates via Canvas, as well as I posted it all over my social media so that my followers could click the link as well. Um, the average length was about two minutes. One of my sample questions asked, do you get your news from social media, um, news websites, or television, or all three? And the results were a bit surprising that I will share momentarily. When it comes to the results, um, they were not what I hoped they were. Um, the first one, the R score, was negative 0 0.0027, meaning there was very little correlation between the two variables. For hypothesis two, it was, the R score was also pretty low, 0 0.055, also showing no correlation. Um, a post hoc hypothesis that I would have you know, for future research would be that students who identify as independent will have a higher, a higher view, a higher level of trust in CNN than they would in Fox News. Now for the discussion. Um, construct one I looked at was news validity, and that is, you know, people seeing certain news networks as trustworthy and untrustworthy based on certain factors like bias and evidence presented. Um, construct two is news network trustworthiness. I know that kind of sounds a little similar, but news network trustiness, trustworthiness is more specific than news validity. It looks at specific news networks and sees how they report on things and determines how trustworthy or untrustworthy they are based on their reporting methods. Construct three is news network usage among young people. Um, that looks at, again, the 18 to 23 age group and <clears throat> just sees how they get their news because that was one of my questions, whether they get their news from television, um, social media, or news websites or all three. And then my final construct was political viewpoints. This looks at how an individual's political viewpoints and biases impact their ability to see news and their ability if they are a journalist to report news. And here are some charts with some interesting information. Um, the first one, we're going to look at the one on, all the way on the left, this little bar graph here. Um, what stood out to me the most here was this question asked on a scale of one to five, one being very liberal, two moderately liberal, three independent, um, four, moderately conservative, and five, very conservative. Um, rate your political affiliation. Um, as you can see, a majority, 34%, were independents, um, and 27.2% identified as moderately conservative, and 22.3% identified as moderately liberal. And this goes to show that um, this age group is not as polarized as people might think. This um, pie chart over here goes back to my previous question of do you get your social media, do you get your news from social media, news websites, television, or all the above? Um, surprising statistic here is you can see the majority here. One third of respondents, 33.3%, said all of the above. And another thing that stood out was that news websites had a higher individual percentage than social media. News websites had about 10.4%, social media, 
about 8.3%. And in terms of how much we trust our news, this one in the bottom right is a real doozy. I asked, do you do, I asked the respondents, do you think that certain news networks have a certain political leaning? And 98% of them said yes. As for the limitations, um, one road bump I ran into was sample size because I was only able to do this with my classmates as well as people who follow me on social media. You know, I'd like to have a bigger sample size than that. Um, survey construction, I would have asked more open-ended questions if I could do this again, and, or asked less open-ended questions because that just created more work. Um, variable measurement, I should have accounted for more people identifying as independent. And future, future research, I would expand it to people ages 18 to 30 and ask respondents to identify their age. Um, I would use other constructs like news trust over time, and I would have a more detailed survey overall. Thank you very much, and tune in for the rest of the presentations. Thank you all for your time today. Hello, my name is Jay Christ, and I am doing my research study on mascots' influence on sports teams and entertainment. So specifically, uh, how specifically mascots' influence on sports teams and how this how mascots influence the sports teams' entertainment. So my first hypothesis: people who identify with sports mascots are more involved with the, with their teams than those who do not. So basically, I'm saying people who like sports mascots and are and and find a connection to their sports mascot are going to be more involved with the sports team that is associated with the mascot. And then my second hypothesis: people who who people who perceive uh, mascots as more approachable will engage in more meetings relating to mascots than those who do not. So basically, saying people who perceive and enjoy mascots will then in turn go and enjoy mascots more and i'm talking about all mascots in uh, sports mascots college uh, minor league and all pro sports um, in every division so 
Mascot char- mascot constructs. So my first construct, mascot character design. So this refers to the mascot character design, such as the suit, uh, the, such as the suit and the personality of the mascot. So uh, as you can see on the screen, you have Elwood right there, right? So he 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 is a very strong horse. He has uh, blown up muscles. So that's the that's the suit design. And then in return, he is then a very uh, strong, does super poses and stuff like that. And then my next construct is. Uh, fan involvement as a result of the mascot and th- as you can see the Philly fanatic this is a result as the mascot uh, as fans are engaged with the result of the mascot as you can see the Philly fanatic is is uh, is raising his hand and fans are actually engaging at him so my next two constructs are branding and advertising so branding and advertising branding is a construct uh, because it is a key concept of professional sports teams and selling merchandise basically Sports teams gain money and revenue off of the logo and based off of what they see. So if, if a sports uh, fan likes the mascot, they're going to say, hey, I want the shirt with the Chicago Cubs. And then mascot recognition. Basically, it's, a, it's, basically it's an association of mascots and how uh, brands are like that. So, for instance, the social media post, uh, the Geico Gecko, right, 15 minutes can save you 15% or more. I'm just simply stating, hey, um, they're mascots associated with companies. So methodology, uh, my participants, the majority of them were uh, in, were 50 per, majority were 18 and 27, so about 50 percent. And then my second large uh, sample was 22.4 percent, and that was 50 to 75 year olds. My uh, procedures was a 10 survey, uh, 10 question anonymous survey. I did a convenience sample and I posted on my social media accounts asking people around campus, family, friends that I contacted. And then my hypothesis, this I had a significant p-value on both of my hypotheses with a p-value that is greater than 0.001%. And I had, a, and then my second hypothesis was equal to p, p equals 0.002%. So discussion. Mascots have a significant influence over sports teams and their fan bases. So uh, as seen in my hypothesis, there is a huge, huge, uh, there's a huge correlation. And then an indication that a fan is more invested with their sports franchise is the amount of merchandise that they are wearing and purchase and wear. So a person is more uh, invested if they have merchandise and logos such as hats. And then mascots' influence over fans are, can be measured by the amount of mascot-related attire uh, purchased and wears. And that's so true because people who wear stuff generally like it. And as you can see in my graph, right, the super sports fan has a stronger correlation of mascot content, meaning people who, who like sports, uh, the mascot is just another tool to increase more excitement and more engagement towards people. And as you can see on the, on the lower half, right, a social sports fan uh, still increases is right there's still a large margin but it's less so limitations time allotted i only had a few weeks to give this survey out so a limitation was the amount of time that i could give the survey out i feel as though i could have a longer if i had the, a longer time of participant a uh, longer time i could definitely do that uh, at least 18 years or older i feel as though mascot lovers are in the are younger than 18 so i feel as though my data could be shown as a stronger correlation of mascots and uh, lovers and f- uh, fan involvement and then a convenient sample of 129 respondents i only had 129 people respond to my survey so I feel as though if I had a sample of 500 I could have definitely grabbed a bigger picture overall of uh, my hypothesis and would have gained a much bigger data so further research Uh, one further research that I'd love to see is mascots uh, and their impact on communities I'd love to see the type of engagement mascots have on their community as you can see the Long Island duck over there with with the little with with a bunch of children over there right uh, corporate mascots versus brand mascots. We can do a further research study about brand recognition and how mascots uh, for sports uh, for for those two companies. And then geographic location, specifically, uh, what countries or states within uh, the United States are higher percentage of mascots, and uh, what's the stronger uh, involvement within that? I feel as though having a geographic location would then uh, really be enticing and say, okay, well, in America, that's the huge mascot market, and so this is where you need a brand the most. So in conclusion, mascots actually are very significant, especially in the sports world. Mascots have a huge, huge impact on people getting enticed and enjoying um, f- uh, sports and on the overall entertainment. So thank you so much. My name is Jay Christ, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Peyton Mulligan, and I here with me Garrett Boggio. We're talking about our research study about the discovery of the real truth of sports betting. So to begin our research topic, um, this was a survey that was conducted uh, primarily with young adults. Um, obviously, this is with sports betting. Um, you have different states that have different laws and regulations um, regarding uh, the minimum legal age to bet. Um, so it was basically um, those young adults um, and the influences and effects of sports betting um, on those participants. Um, the reason we chose this, um, there's a growing sports uh, betting market. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, big major companies have invested thousands of dollars, um, beyond millions of dollars, um, into promotion and advertising. Um, so that's kind of why we wanted to dive into this. Uh, research gap um, in our study, it was discovered that there was a lack of research done um, on the influences of sports betting. And this type of gambling um, has only become newly popular um, with major events like um, March Madness, Super Bowl, stuff like that. Uh, our hypothesis, um, the more participants are exposed to gambling promotions, the more likely they are to engage in gambling. So basically, the more they see it, the more they're going to be engaged. Um, our research question was uh, basically what factors have the most influences um, on participants developing uh, this gambling addiction. Our post-hypothesis question uh, was that people that play for money are more influenced by others who are playing to win uh, and the competition. For our participants, one of the things we did not consider was the demographic. We thought that we were really considering like, the involvement and the engagement of participants and users, and we thought that gender did not play a, play a role in our participants, but something that we could do for further research was consider that as a variable, and as uh, considered as a variable. But in the market that we were just re researching, we discovered that a strong majority of people that were using it are, major are majority male, so we figured that it was not a variable. Out of our procedure, we uh, we did a survey about a dozen questions answering about the um, involvement in the, the uh, gambling scale and see what really what, what was the influences and what were the strongest influences of people developing um, gambling addictions and what what influenced them to participate in sports betting. Of our results, we discovered the t-test revealed that there's not a strong uh, there's not a statistically strong um, statistic that shows that there's a correlation between the influences and the gambling addiction. We we just discovered that there's not a small there's no, there's a, only a small uh, correlation between promotion on social media and developing that gambling addiction. Um, on our second hypothesis, uh, there's a, the piercing correlation with the two variables when was not significant as well, thus uh, showing that there's not a significant relationship between the two variables. For our discussion, we decided to focus on gamification and uh, human behavior. So for gamification, uh, this is basically a point system in winnings uh, that creates a value that can be converted into currency. So these big companies, um, it's a monetary value basically, uh, you, use, you use their, their money um, 
it's also your money, but it's uh, it's their it's their value system um, that they've created basically for this. Um, and then human human behavior, uh, the impact of participation uh, is basically a key factor uh, for these major companies. So the more likely they are to uh, see those advertisements and those companies put those advertisements in front of them, the more likely they are to uh, engage in, in sports betting. The third contract that we considered was gambling addiction. One of the strongest influences of inside of sports betting is de developing that gambling addiction. Um, gamification and human behavior was one of the things that led to gambling, addic was led to gambling addiction. Um, this point system and this value system of not really using um, real money is what really d influenced them to develop that gambling addiction and would led them to participate more often and, and, more, and spend more and more money with using a point system rather than using traditional USD. Um, another one was a cognitive dissonance. This really focuses on the behavior that users have when they when they're sports betting. Cognitive dissonance is that belief that they continue they can continue to win that money back even if they're losing. They can continue to go back and win that money back, and there's so, there's always an up. They will always win, somehow win that money back, and either even if they're digging a bigger and bigger hole with themselves. That that really develops that gambling addiction that we figured. We found that that, that construct was one of the strongest ones we that related to our research study. So uh, a little bit about our discussion. Um, overall. Um, overall, uh, betting on and uh, what influences users to bet on different platforms, one of the discoveries that we made um, was basically that this promotion is one of the largest influential tools um, that these companies can use um, to attract with the growing influx um, of how social media is used in today's, today's day. Um, it's just, it's, uh, it provides a way for those companies to, to further reach a, a broader audience. So that was one of the major discoveries that we had, um, and it was pretty cool learning about that. For our limitations, one of the limitations that we had was that we only had a survey size of, of 100 people, and out of the 100 people that we had, we had users that did not follow the uh, survey properly, so we had to actually eliminate some users. We did not get a full 100 uh, number of people sa sample size for our survey, so we c for further research, we could develop a, long, a larger sample size. Um, for the survey construct, um, we did not measure the frequency, so therefore we did not f um, measure the amount of promotion that, they were, that users were receiving and seeing. Uh, if there was more, if more promotion was influencing them more rather than the type of influence, uh, type of promotion, it, that was something we could use for further research to see if the, if more promotion, seeing it more frequently, was had a, a stronger influence on the amount of people gambled. Um, another variable that could be measured was the engagement versus the involvement. That, w that one of the limitations that we had was that the con the questions that we asked did not fully answer that qu uh, that research question that we had. So th therefore, for our further future research, that we could. Uh, an we could change the questions for that to further answer those, that research topic. For future research, um, obviously we want to have uh, more than 100. Uh, we didn't, uh, we met our mark, but we want to have a more um, broader uh, sample size to give us a more uh, in-depth um, study. Other constructs, we want to dive into entertainment. Um, this is a very big key, key takeaway for us. Uh, we believe that entertainment um, does play a key role um, in this, but it's an underlying issue. But we believe that if we could look into that future research with entertainment, we do believe there is some type of correlation um, that is related to that. Um, lastly, our experimental method, um, winnings versus mental health. Um, in some way, shape, or form, there's got to be these people losing constant money. They've got to be hurting somehow. Um, and then initial bet uh, versus mental health. So that's uh, pre-initial pre bet. So how, do they, how are they feeling um, before that initial bet um, and then thereafter? So we appreciate you all listening in. Thank you very much.
Hi, I'm Joseph Leo, and this is Catherine Cunningham, and together we looked at the effect of social media use on anxiety. During this project, we took a look at four key concepts, anxiety, social media use, platform preference, and gender. The research gap that we found when looking at previous research um, showed that a lot of research focused on young adolescents, and they also don't take into account the type of content that their participants were viewing. So with that, um, our first hypothesis was if participants use Twitter for longer periods of time, then they will experience higher levels of anxiety than people who use Twitter for shorter periods of time. And our research question was, do participants who use Twitter experience higher levels of anxiety compared to their levels of anxiety on Facebook and Instagram? For our methodology, we wanted to find participants between the ages of 18 and 40, and we recruited them through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we also ensured confidentiality by making sure any responses we received were completely anonymous. The survey that we created was three, approximately three minutes long, and some sample questions include, how many hours a day do you spend on Twitter, and what type of content do you view more of on Facebook? Our results showed that for hypothesis one, there was not a significant difference between the levels of anxiety in shorter periods of time or longer periods of time for Twitter. Therefore, our first hypothesis was not supported. Our research question did show a significant difference between the levels of anxiety on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. However, our research question was not answered. Our post hoc hypothesis is people who are over the age of 30 experience higher levels of anxiety on Facebook compared to those under the age of 30. For our discussion, we took a look at anxiety, social media use, gender, and platform preference. When looking at anxiety, we wanted to see the correlation between anxiety and time spent on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We also looked at what type of media participants viewed, as well as whether their platform preference affected their anxiety levels. We found participants who showed higher levels of anxiety posted more negatively than those that didn't. We also looked at how gender affected anxiety levels and found that men tend to use social media more when they feel emotionally distressed. Um, platform preference found that more people use Facebook and Instagram than Twitter, which leads us to our findings. In our findings, um, table one shows that it, our levels were not significant because they differ, they don't differ too much from short versus long periods of time. Um, and table two shows the, the participants that use Facebook and Instagram more show extremely higher levels of anxiety than those that use Twitter. So limitations that we came across during our research was mainly a small sample size and a majority female sample size. We think because it was pretty small, we weren't able to get the best quality results. Something else that played into that was the fact that we use our personal social media accounts to distribute our survey, so we had a limited reach. And our survey questions, first, looking at the content, we allowed text box answers, which then required us to categorize and either toss, either categorize or toss our responses, which may have affected the quality as well. For future research, we recommend focusing on older age groups because of the results that we found with our current sample, and we also recommend a higher sample si or a bigger sample size for higher quality results. And lastly, we also recommend looking at the content that participants view because we think narrowing that down will be able to understand a bit more about how certain types of content can affect somebody's levels of anxiety. Thank and you, oh. Oh. and we hope that this future research. Thank you. We hope this future research or this help we hope this research helps future research figure out exactly what it is about social media that affects people's levels of anxiety. Thank you.
where I'll go. Close your tired eyes, sleep for a little while. Just put your guitar down, down in its old case. Play it safe. Your mistakes, let them all go. Your broken dreams, your high hopes. Love so delicate. Life is sometimes strange. Sometimes it takes a big rain to feel the sun again. Sometimes it takes a big rain. Hi, I'm Madison Evans. And I'm Andrea McClay. And we chose to do our research on the perceptions of gender expression and its effects on mental health in males. So with male emotional expression, emotional or personality, or just any type of um, facet that strongly that they strongly identify with, whether it has to be political or outside of that, um, it's greatly suppressed in a lot of ways. And we felt as though it'd be interesting to explore those nuances and kind of um, take off the divides and the labels and really dive into how men express themselves emotionally and otherwise and um, because of this lack of emphasis in our society. So our research question was, to what extent do societal connotations influence expression of male emotions? For our methodology, we chose to interview college-age males aging from 18 to 22. Uh, to recruit these participants, we uh, used word of mouth and also digital communication. And throughout these interviews, they lasted about 20 minutes each. We interviewed 12 participants, and after each interview, we transcribed all of the information and then later on found the commonalities and repetition through each of their responses. In our data analysis, we came up with four different themes, um, essentially a spectrum or a Venn diagram, if you will, on from strategic masculinity, which is a very traditional role of masculinity in society, patriarchal, if you will, um, and on the other spectrum, it was kind of defying those patriarchal ideas, but not in a way of annexing them completely, more so a mix of them and like seeing that polarity in that people have, um, regardless of which side that they're on. For our results section, um, for strategic masculinity, it, um, there was a lot of mention of loving violence and um, really aggressive tendencies. There was no mention of any other emotion unless asked by me um, of any type of emotional range. So for the, the strategic masculine category, um, it, there was the least amount of range of emotion, unfortunately. Um, as far as strategic masculine exceptions, they tended to be individuals who identified with traditional masculine roles, but not in a very intentional way, like in comparison to the first category. Um, and then for alternative awareness sensitivity, it was the complete opposite of men who don't go out of their way to identify with the alternative of traditional roles, but men who um, have found themselves in those categories, specifically the one that I interviewed was um, he works in the arts department and he's always surrounded by females and it was very much a not a choice for him it was just kind of where he found himself and in our last category it was um alternative awareness of emotion and basically it was kind of the polarity between the two spectrums um you know men who were str like strongly masculine strongly masculine and but also identified with very opposite traits and then vice versa as well uh, for our discussion we found that um, the range of perception heavily influenced um, excuse me the research showed that a various range of emotions and percep perceptions among young males it was concluded that the finding 
that finding the range of perception heavily influenced the perceived range of emotions. Um, most subjects describe their emotional perception as inaccurate based on the societal expectations and associations with male behavior and mental health. Um, the Alternative Awareness Sensitivity Group had most awareness of mental health and emotion, and the uh, strategic masculine category exhibited illicit, strong, and nonverbal responses. Unfortunately, even if um, they weren't aware of what they were saying, they they would say something so insightful or profound, but then would totally dismiss it and think that they didn't have any emotional awareness, um, which I found very interesting. The limitations for this research uh, really relied on the amount of participants we used. Uh, if we were to do it again, we would have included more participants and asked uh, significantly more questions, particularly pertaining to their mental health. And also, we would have increased the age so we could have gotten, gotten a larger demographic for um, each participant. I would also say triangulation. Um would have been nice for this study specifically for the people who didn't feel comfortable um, sharing the suppressed emotions that were very obvious through nonverbal communication but were not spoken. Um, so for the future research we would increase the age of participants just because we did such a short um, range really college age and um, we would have used more participants having only 12 initially um, and there's a lot of nuance in this so we wanted as many viewpoints as possible and we definitely would have asked more questions specifically about sexuality and the sexual interpretation and um, impacts that they would have on their partners and that they have had from society themselves. And lastly, to repeat what I said, the most important thing that we found was asking more questions because at first we only asked a series of 12 and we thought that asking more would be more beneficial.
Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Simon. I'm Daniel Malanfi. And this is Saturday Night Live's effect on viewers' political partisan levels. Uh, so for our research topic, this study explores the effects of the late night comedy show Saturday Night Live, also known as SNL, uh, and the political world while analyzing its impact using the agenda setting theory. Uh, for our research gap, um, previous research focused on how SNL f affects viewers' political views. Uh, we focus on the political view or the political decisions of viewers, and in other words, uh, their decisions at the ballot box. Um, and for our first hypothesis that we developed, uh, we developed or we said the more participants watch SNL, the more their levels of political polarization will increase. For our research question, we asked, what is the impact of SNL on political polarization? Uh, when retrieving all of our data, we developed a post hoc hypothesis, which is the more participants watched SNL, the more likely it affected their choice at the ballot box. For our methodology, we uh, did a sur about a three minute survey that me and Daniel both posted on our uh, social media platforms. Um, they asked uh, Likert scale questions, and before cleaning up the results, we had 104 participants. Um, but due to the fact that two participants didn't answer the uh, survey completely through, we decided to get rid of uh, two. Um, and we ultimately found that our first hypothesis was not significant, uh, but our research question and post hoc hypothesis were significant. For the discussion, we looked at the agenda setting theory and applied that to this research, as I mentioned before. Uh, the idea, uh, or the agenda setting theory, is the idea that the more people are exposed to the media, the more likely uh, they are to believe the media. Uh, what this means is the more people watch SNL, the more likely they, are, they will implement uh, the show's satire into their political decisions as well. Um, and then we looked at political polarization levels, and this is the partisan levels of a citizen voter. Um, that this means that the more biased a voter is towards their political party, and we said that those who watch SNL will increase in their uh, partisan levels. We also looked at voting decision, and that's the effect that SNL has on viewers' decision at the ballot box. Um, and that is a voter uses their knowledge rooted from their consumption of SNL uh, political parodies. And also we looked at setting the political agenda and how SNL so sets the political agenda. Uh, their political parodies influence the political world. Um, and for example, the impersonations of political candidates on SNL force viewers to develop negative assumptions towards said candidates. For the remainder of our discussion, as Jacob said, our hypothesis was the more participants that watch SNL, the more uh, their levels of political polarization increase. And for the discussion, we talk about the hypothesis finding, how agenda setting theory uh, applies to our research and the post hoc analysis. And so for our hypothesis finding, the results showed that SNL political parodies did not significantly affect the, per the participants' partisan levels. And agenda setting was a big theory in our uh, research, and this theory was not found to be the case uh, in the study because the partisan levels of the participants were not affected. And for the post hoc analysis, uh, participants are informed enough to know that SNL uh, parodies are exaggerated, therefore not having an effect on their political views. And for limitations, our sample size was 102. Uh, one of the constructs we believe was a big construct was many participants fell under Gen Z. And we believe that older generations have watched more SNL compared to the younger audience. So SNL did not have an effect on our participants as much as we thought. And our variable measurement was that half our participants identified in the middle of the political spectrum and that being centrist. And so for future research, uh, we advise that they direct, they direct their research towards liberals and conservatives because they have stronger views as compared to people with views of centrist. And another construct is that we believe they should use an older audience, uh, being Gen X, and that's because we believe using an older, uh, an older audience, uh, they are more informed with politics as compared to the younger uh, audience. And for experimental method, we believe that researchers analyzing participants who are not well informed uh, or engaged in politics because they might be easily persuaded to SNL as compared to people who are informed with uh, politics. 
Uh, we'd like to thank you for your time tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed our research. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to hear our presentation today. I'm Ryan Miller. I'm Jack Donovan. Our research focuses on caffeine in college students using symbolic interactionism theory. Symbolic interactionism is used in our research by analyzing college students' perceptions of caffeine and how they, how they use it and view it in their everyday lives. Our study examines the relationship between college students and their use of legal stimulants, most commonly in the forms of coffee and energy drinks. We did combat gaps in our research as the topic had little research and the research that was present focused on caffeine's effect on the human body rather than the perception that we wanted to focus on. Our first research question was, what role do legal stimulants like coffee and energy drinks play in college students' lives? Our second research question was, do college students perceive certain uh, caffeinated beverages differently than others? Our methodology was completed by interviewing 20 juniors and seniors in college. We interviewed six females and 14 males. 
We recruited through word of mouth and social media. The average length of interviews was about five to six minutes. Once we complete the interviews, we transcribe them through the app Otter, then analyze them to identify themes. We identified themes using repetition and identifying patterns, keywords, and characterization. The first result that we found was that a majority of participants consume coffee in the mornings. Uh, when asked about their ca coffee consumption habits, one participant said, I usually have a cup of coffee every morning or get Starbucks when I go to campus. The relevance of this is that it helps us to understand the relationship uh, between students and reliance on caffeine because this was a consistent theme among participant answers. The second result was that caffeine consumption was used for focus to complete assignments and daily tasks. Uh, our example here was that one participant said, I drink coffee when I need an energy boost to get my homework done. This helps us to understand students rely on stimulants to get them through long stretches of time with large workloads. Our third result was that a majority of participants had a negative perception of those who do consume energy drinks. Uh, one participant even said, I don't really understand why people need energy drinks. The relevance of this was that it showed us that there is a negative stereotype towards one stimulant over the others that college students do consume. Through this, our research had le has led us to believe these main points, that the most popular form of legal stimulants among college students is coffee. It also helped us understand that the negative stereotype surrounding people who uh, consume energy drinks is very real. We also found that prescription stimulants are not nearly as common among college students as previously thought. Examples of these include caffeine pills. These findings have led us to believe that coffee is the most popular form of stimulant intake for college students, and a majority of them greatly rely on its effects on a daily basis. Energy drinks, however, have developed a negative stereotype and are more frequently used at night. Limitations within our research, we found that when conducting interviews, uh, a majority of our participants were men. This um, uh, enabled us to understand that female uh, college students intake caffeine and it affects their, them differently than men, so it could have given us different results if we had evened out our participants. Uh, another limitation is the sample size of participants. We only interviewed about 20, uh, 20 seniors at Longland University, and our research could have benefited from more research and more time to give us a wider understanding and a broader understanding of how this affects campus as a whole. Our final limitation that we found was the li limited amount of previous research on this topic. While most research focused on caffeine-specific uh, scientific function in the body how it, and how it breaks down, uh, very, very few research was conducted on uh, this, the effects uh, and relationship between college students and caffeine. For future research, we recommend that we apply this study to other universities across the United States as this would uh, enable us to have a broader view of how this relationship uh, changes and divides across the United States. Uh, we also believe that we should apply this research to a larger student body uh, and not just juniors and seniors that we interviewed here. Thank you for coming to our presentation.
Hello everyone, my name is Ashley Torres. And I'm Heather Waldo, and today we're going to be talking about our research study, which is young people's purchasing habits through Instagram and TikTok. So to start off, um, basically a just little overview of our project, we wanted to look at people's overall experiences with Instagram and TikTok, specifically young people, and how it affects their purchasing habits on those platforms. And we chose to um, study this topic because we felt that there was not enough research done between the differences between Instagram and TikTok and how that would affect um, purchasing habits on those platforms. And then below you can see our hypotheses and research question. So then um, as far as the methodology goes, um, our primary participants were between the ages of 18 and 25. And um, at the conclusion of our survey, we had 141 total responses, but then we went through and narrowed it down to 132 responses because um, we had to take out the ones that didn't include age because that was an important part of our study. So we were left with 132 valid responses. And then we have the statistics for um, all the participants below. And for our procedures, we used a survey with um, mostly the questions were scales one to five and then one open-ended question. And it took about four minutes for um, each person to complete the survey. So then we have two examples of our questions um, on the slide. One is the open-ended question and one is a question using um, the scale from one to five. And then the results, um, all like our hypothesis, research question, and post hoc hypothesis um, showed all significant relationships and the p-values are on the screen. So then um, our discussion, we used four constructs um, to analyze our study. So the first one was social media and um, previous research showed that professional looking photos received higher engagement, but our data um, kind of conflicted with this study because the TikTok video advertisement received um, like more favoritism from our participants, which that was more of a casual video. And then um, influencers, um, the data showed that that does like make a difference in marketing campaigns. And that also um, contradicted our study because our participants basically said that they were not as interested or didn't follow influencers as much as that previous data showed. So our third construct was visual communication, and our research suggested that um, video advertising is becoming more effective than still image advertising in relation to social media marketing. And um, our results supported this because 54% of our participants stated that they would rather purchase the item showcased in the video advertisement rather than the still image advertisement. And our fourth and final construct was consumer habits, and we related this back directly to social media. And our findings suggested that social media directly impacts um, purchasing habits amongst consumers. And um, our results also supported this idea because 71% of our participants stated that the advertisements that they see on Instagram um, on their personal feed were relevant to them, which leads them typically more to make a purchase from those advertisements. And 55, excuse me, 55% of our participants agreed with the same sentiment on TikTok. So what all this means is that even though we had contradictions from our research to our results in relation to social media and influencers, um, we still found statistical significance within um, our hypotheses and research question. So some limitations that we faced were that of our scales. Um, we created all of our own scales and we feel that if we had used scales that were previously created by um, scholars that it would have been easier to analyze when looking at our results of our survey. And then also when creating our questions we should have created more questions that um, could combine our variables, our variables and their averages. Um, we could not do that with the questions that we created. And then finally, um, we had a limitation when it came to sampling because we used a convenience sample and when you use a convenience sample, you cannot generalize to a greater population. And as for future research, um, we feel that there should be more clarification about the role that influencers play and because of the contradictions that we saw in our research and 
Um, also, for impulse buying theory, we feel that there should be updated research on this because it really could apply to our topic, but there was not any updated research to modernize that. And in the entirety of our research process, we feel that we have made a general contribution to the topic, and we appreciate your time today. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Brooklyn Judy. And I'm Marissa Yeager. And today we will, we will be presenting our research study on user communication strategies on TikTok. So for this study, we looked at communication strategies across different age groups using TikTok. We chose this topic because the information had not been studied yet in the field of communication. Uh, we found that there was research gaps, so numerous studies have been done about TikTok, but not in the field of communication. And research also lacks information regarding sharing content across the application. So we created three research questions to guide our study. Our first research question was, how do different age groups utilize the TikTok platform? The second research question was, how do different age groups communicate using TikTok? 
And our third research question was, how informed are TikTok users about the algorithm? All right, and now moving into our methodology our, with our participants, our demographics were males and females aging from 18 to 25 years old. Our recruitment procedures had a social media post directed towards them. Our procedures had uh, 12 interviews in total, each lasting about 20 minutes each, and used the Otter application in terms of our transcription process. For our data analysis, we used something called a thematic analysis, which helped develop themes using repetition, keywords, and forcefulness. So we found several themes for our results. Uh, one theme was escaping reality and gaining entertainment and information. So we found most participants use TikTok as a way to escape from their everyday troubles by watching entertaining or informing videos. So one participant stated, escape at the end of the day and to relax when explaining why and how they use TikTok. And this answer helps answer our first research question of how do different age groups utilize the TikTok platform. Another theme we found was using TikTok as a way of communicating with others. We found that most participants communicate on TikTok by sharing videos to family and friends. Uh, for example, one participant stated, me and my roommate always go back and forth and share TikToks we like. This helps answer our second research question, how do different age groups communicate using TikTok? All right, going into our third theme, we're looking at TikTok through a different lens. A majority of our participants' perception of social media has changed due to using TikTok. An example of one of the participants' quotes saying that social media is not all that bad, and there are videos saying that it's bad for you, but there are videos that are very impactful and important to your life. Uh, the relevance is that it helps answer our first research question, which is how do different age groups utilize the TikTok platform? And then finally, going into our final theme, we are looking at TikTok users believing that the For You page is tailored to their personality. Uh, most participants understood that TikTok's For You page adjusted depending on what the content was like with the interactive user. And an example of this is, I feel like the For You page is tailored to videos that you've liked. If you like one video, you'll get more videos like that. And it helps answer our second research question of how do different age groups communicate using TikTok. So for our discussion, we emphasized the several themes we found over the study and our three research questions that guided them. Uh, we emphasized how personality seemed to guide the direction of answers of the partic participants and their For You page of TikTok. Uh, we emphasized how escapism was a term to describe a way for participants to get away from everyday life and stressors. Uh, and we emphasize that the opinions of social media determined how our participants perceived TikTok uh, and answers were on two different ends of the spectrum. So some of our participants found social media and TikTok to be very negative while others uh, viewed it to be very positive. All right, going into our limitations, we had three. Our first was an uneven number of females to males. Uh, we did have nine female participants and three male participants. Uh, we were unable to generalize finding for our male participants. The second is knowing some of the participants. Uh, there was a possibility of bias between this and also the answers could be partial truths. And finally, there was a unable to un answer interview questions. Um, some questions did not need to be asked and other questions could have been asked in terms of that. So for our future research, uh, we would recommend uh, for future researchers to conduct interviews together. Uh, research partners should conduct the interviews together for a more effective study. Uh, we recommend for researchers to practice the interview before giving an official interview. Uh, this could eliminate unnecessary questions, um, and then researchers would be able to add questions to better answer the research questions. And then lastly, uh, we would like to see um, more about TikTok's unique features such as TikTok Live and Top 100. Uh, and we would like to see a study for more content creators because our study lacked content creators for particip uh, participants. Uh, so this is our study and we hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you for tuning in and we hope you have a good day. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Allie. And I'm Kylie Cahill. And we will be presenting on social media influencers and how it impacts self-confidence. An important theory that we use during our research is known as the social comparison theory, which states that people evaluate their abilities and attitudes in relation to those of others in a process that plays a significant role in self-image and subjective well-being. So moving on to our first slide, we have um, social media influencers, and a social media influencer is a person who has built a reputation for their knowledge and expertise on a specific topic. And in our study, we asked people to take a survey of 10 questions relating to their self-confidence when viewing social media influencers' posts. Some research gaps that we considered during our um, research study is that people have different concepts of who they are and there could be many possibilities into how somebody views themselves. Our two hypotheses were number one being the more in, um, influencers, the more influencers, Instagram users ages 18 to 25 follower, the lower level of self-confidence they will likely have and our second hypothesis was the more time users spend on Instagram, the lower level, they will have a lower level of self-confidence. Moving on to our methodology section, for the participants we reached out to, they were between ages 18 and 25 that were willing to complete our survey and discuss their self-confidence and how social media influencers play a part in that. In total, we had around 102 responses with 85.2% being female. To find our participants, we reached out on our social media platforms and through text message and sent it out to people throughout our school. For our procedure, we had a 10 question survey that took about three minutes to complete. Questions based on influencers and self-confidence levels. As you can see at the top of the slide here, there's an example of how often do you compare yourself to blue check, check Instagram influencers on Instagram. This is how we did self-confidence and compared it to social media influencers. For our results, we had, um, for our hypothesis, one that more influencers resulted in lower levels of self-confidence. This left us with a p-value of 0 .039. This was significant, which was the opposite of our prediction. And um, significance is when you accept the hypothesis, and if it is not significant, you will reject the null hypothesis. For our second hypothesis, we had the more time spent, um, the lower levels of self-confidence they will have. This was not significant with a p-value of 0 0.382. Um, we predicted it to be more time spent would equal lower self-confidence, so this was opposite as well. This was because we predicted that there would be overall higher levels of self-confidence than were projected. For moving on to our Hawk analysis, um, the p-value was significant and that is what we predicted. After gathering all of our data, we went back and conducted our Hawk analysis and predicted that the more types of influencers that per participants follow, the more likely they are to feel less confident. So moving on to our discussion, we had four constructs, the first being body image and the second being confidence. 
Body image is known as thoughts and feelings and perceptions that one has of their own body and how it appears. This was important to our study because when looking at body image, it is how somebody views themselves within the social media platform, specifically Instagram. And this construct ended up not being so important towards the end of the study because we realized that participants' ideas of self-confidence and body image um, constructed into one instead of separate. And then the second one was confidence, and that can be defined as how one views themselves as a member in society. Uh, confidence played a big role in our research because it is how the participants were describing how they felt upon viewing uh, the Instagram post by the influencers. Moving on to our next two constructs, we had self-image. This is the idea of one's per abilities, appearance, and personality. This relates to our study because people can alter the way they're viewed on social media, um, which also plays a role in how they feel confident, the way they show themselves on social media um, goes hand in hand with their confidence. An example of this is conforming to societal norms and trends. Moving on to gender, this is idealistic images of gender by society. Um, you can be whoever you want. This is relates to our study because we had 85.2% of females and only 13.9% of males that completed our survey. Um, the different genders confined in different ways and that is presented through their self-confidence. So in our discussion, we realized that self-confidence is not necessarily influenced by Instagram influencers, but more so when they were following more types of influencers is when their self-confidence was being affected and our different uh, constructs helped us to realize and reach that realization. And in a larger perception, we now know that there are many variables that go into how the partic participants took away from how they were considered to be um, influenced. So for limitations with the sample size, it's considerable differences in responses based on gender. Um, the survey construction has more questions surrounding confidence levels, would have helped us with um, better understanding of confidence levels and how people perce perceive themselves. Um, the variable measurement, ha we think that we should have had additional questions on each variable to further justify our research data with more questions, given of the variables, we could have um, presented it better and had more information. Um, so concluding our research, we realized that overall self-confidence is really just based on who you are as an individual and how it affects you um, on the social media app. Thank you.
Hey everyone, I'm Bryce Matthews. And I'm Caleb Gotcher, and today we'll be talking about augmented reality and its ability to become an escape from real life communication. So, I would like to start off with our research topic. What exactly are we doing? So the purpose of this research study is to understand the growth of augmented reality and the effects it has on students' day-to-day -day life. Our research gap, our intended research gap, was on the theory of symbolic interactionism. Throughout this communication phenomena, symbolic interactionism was present. According to our research, um, Charlotte Nickerson, 2021, symbolic interactionism is the hypothesis claims that individuals respond to components of their individual environments based on a subjective meaning they assign to themselves. These meanings are formed and modified through social interaction. <clears throat> so, our research question, what factors contribute to developing healthy relationships through augmented reality? Um, next is our methodology section. The recruitment of our, our, of our participants was focused on college students between the ages of 18 and 22. We recruited our interviewees through face-to-face -face interactions and Facebook posts stating what our research is on and giving a little preview of what we, would, what we will be talking about. Overall, we recruited and conducted 12 interviews that ended up having an average length of around 20 minutes each. We transcribed these interviews through an app called Otter and we approach the analysis of these transcriptions with a thematic analysis, and we look for repetition, keywords, and forcefulness within interviewee's statements. Transitioning to our results, I would like to focus on our first theme, creature comforts. More specifically, this theme focuses on the sense of comfortability when immersing oneself into augmented reality. For example, one of our participants stated, now thinking about it, I feel comfortable taking that off now that I've used it for so long. This is relevant to the research considering individuals feel more comfortable. Once an individual immerses themselves in this form of augmented reality, they get a sense of comfortability. Secondly, our second theme, augmented civilization. This theme more specifically focuses on the overall effects augmented reality has on society as a whole. Example that a participant gave. Instead of portraying what you think it is portraying, it is actually portraying a completely different version of you in reality. <clears throat> this is relevant to the research considering individuals are not being held accountable. More specifically, individuals feel as if they, they are portraying what they are seeing online is not always what they are receiving firsthand. <clears throat> Another theme that we identified within the interviews was factitious identities. This theme focuses on how augmented reality face filters can create an artificial representation of an individual. An example statement of this is, I feel like heavy usage of filters such as Snapchat filters could form false relationships. This touches on the idea that with the help of augmented reality, um, individuals can present themselves as someone they are not when communicating and forming relationships online. For the fourth overarching theme, dyadic augmentation. More specifically, this theme focuses on the information that augmented reality provides when communicating to form overall relationships. For example, one of our participants stated, once you scan it, it will have a vague visual graphic to it. This is relevant to our overall research considering augmented reality can inform an individual when forming a, a relationship. More specifically on dyadic augmentation, when using augmented reality to educate yourself on a presented topic, whether that be art or something else, augmented reality tends someone, teaches someone more than they might know just by increasing these features. Uh, the next theme that we identified is social media augmentation. This theme focuses on the usage of augmented reality within popular social media platforms. One participant stated that they consume pretty much all of their day, therefore they have an impact on their day-to-day -day activities. This, to, this goes to show that social media and augmented reality can be overused and consume individuals' lives. The last theme that we identified was pers persistent diversions. This theme focuses on the distractions that augmented reality creates within mobile applications. An example of this is that a participant stated, a negative effect of the apps that I have used that incorporate augmented reality is the distractions. This is relevant because applications can create constant distractions within individuals' everyday lives. So for a discussion, <clears throat> some things that were relevant throughout the discussion that we would like to address are stereotypes. Stereotypes between the recognition of the role augmented reality plays on an individual's life when it comes to both males and females when, while interacting with social media platforms. 
<clears throat> it was it was shown throughout the discussion that a comprehension of what augmented reality entails was more skewed towards the male's perspective rather than the female's perspective. <clears throat> Secondly, focusing on the effects augmented reality has when interacting with makeup, live filters, features. <clears throat> it was shown that the males had more of a understanding of what exactly these makeup features included when immersing in themselves in augmented reality. However, the female perspective knew exactly what they were. However, they didn't address it on a face-to-face -face interview regarding augmented reality. Our second discussion, <clears throat> commonality, that we would like to address, or commonality is expressing the fact that augmented reality has an overarching effect of what exactly makes us human. Individuals are more likely to have a better awareness of what is going on around them when immersing themselves in augmented reality. This was very common. Secondly, augmented reality has the potential to take over our individual lives in the near future. For example, according to our participant, I think we are going away from like what makes us human. What are we? Are we like a form of animal or are we this sort of thing that's a body that is immersed and merged with technology? That's ultimately what we need to decide as a society. What are we and what, would, what do we want to do with ourselves? After this research study was completed, we, we identified some slight limitations. These limitations being equal identities, as we believe that an evil, even sexual representation may have evened out our results, mutual connections that may have created bias and less, less truthfulness in the answers, age as a wider age range would have given us a wider perception of augmented reality in today's society, and time as a longer time span to conduct interviews would have helped. Future research. We would like to in our future research, we would like to do equal recruitment. Recruit individuals equally in representation regarding 50% female and 50% male. Secondly, a more precise topic. Focus on specific aspects of augmented reality, like such as video games, social media, education, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Smiled on my soul, told me a story too good to prove. Wide open space, joy in my heart, in the gardens of Manito Park. I'm homesick most for a place I don't. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Breslin. And I'm Matthew Lovred. And over the course of the last semester, we have been researching the uh, media's influence on sports gambling. The main idea of this research was to find out how the media impacts the sports gambling world. Th through the, throughout the study, we found the research gap to be the social media specific involvement between the influence and its participation. Going into this research, we started with two hypotheses. Hypothesis one was if a fan is watching their favorite sports team specifically, they are more likely to bet on that game specifically. The second one being if a male is exposed to a prominent sports figure in these advertisements, then they are more likely to download that specific sports book. 
Now going on to the methodology and first getting into a little about what responses we kept and deleted because of the 122 responses we did have, we only kept 115. And that was due to responses in surveys that weren't completely filled out or were missing information and weren't deemed credible. And with that, how we did distributed the survey was through group chats, um, Discord chats, and as well as social media posts. As well as then moving on to the procedures, it was 14 questions which only took two to three minutes in time roughly. And it was distributed again throughout different social media platforms as well as individual group messages. And as far as the, st the statistical significance of the results for the first hypothesis, which was again, if a fan is watching their, their favorite sports team, then they are more likely to place a bet. We found that not significant in that terms of statistical data, but as you'll turn, learn in the limitations, there were some other factors that went into that. And as well as the second hypothesis, which was again, if a participant is exposed to a prominent sports figure in sports gambling advertisements, then they are more likely to download that specific sports app. But as again, we found the p-value to not be significant in our study. And then one final thing for the results was our post hoc hypothesis, which tested two of our different variables, which were related to how often participants watch their favorite sports teams compared to how often they actually place bets, which in this we did find a significant correlation. After conducting the study, some elements were very clear to us. And that first one being that fandom drives direct interaction um, consistency with the betters and the sports book. Fandom is the state or condition of being a fan of something or someone. This relates directly to our study because it changed a lot of inter individuals' interactions throughout the, uh, throughout the websites, the gambling websites. Participants also provided uh, an increase in wagers when watching their direct favorite sports team. Monetary gain was also something we found consistent through our study as participants admitted to um, betting fi for financial benefit regardless if their team was uh, playing or not. So moving on to our other themes, starting off with prominent sports figures. And the idea behind that was kind of people like FanDuel who have signed out contracts to former athletes like Pat McAfee to kind of got, guide a bigger drawing to those who have, might have been a fan when he played and how that relates into people who actually go to the specific sports like. And within our results, we did, we did find influence through it, but we did not deem it as significant as there was not a driving force behind it and there's still some illegitimate thoughts behind the spe some specific sports agencies. And then going on to gamification, and this is where we, s we didn't find as much about in our results, but we think this is where much of our future research lies as the avenue in of sports gambling continues to get bigger and bigger. It's become, you see stuff like sp fantasy and daily sports kind of getting that repetition from its participants. After all of our data was collected, we found a number of patterns uh, consisting of fandom drives direct motivation to how an individual interacts with sports gambling. Seeing a favorite athlete represents a sports book would increase your odds to download that specific sports book. Uh, participants are still betting for financial benefit regardless of their team being involved. And online sports gambling sites will offer free bets as a way to get customers more active on their websites. Moving on to the overall limitations and diversity to begin with what we did deem as a limitation due to the fact that the sample size we were get gathering did not have a vast age participant, mainly rooted at the college age people 18 or 21 through 25. And as well as that, with the actual survey contract, it, it left a lot of up for different interpretation for that R specific dependent variable one, how often do you play sports bets of any kind? We saw that as a limitation because if someone's more of a football fan and it's baseball season, they're not necessarily gonna place as many bets. And then lastly, kind of just more specific for participants in the middle, that was people who gamble averagely maybe couldn't report as best as we would have liked to gauge how much they actually participate. And as for our future research, kind of wrapping it up, we could change our sample um, by seeing how active participants are on social media and the influence that that has on their gambling, gambling influence. And an additional construct, we would propose to research the impact of addiction on participants that have uh, gambling habits. We could also carry this research out by in, in, interviewing participants on their gambling tendencies. And with that, that wraps up our presentation. Thank you all for listening, and we hope you found this as interesting as we did. Thanks.
everyone, my name is Ashley Rebin and these are my research partners, Molly Smith and Allison Lee. Over the last semester, we did research on the Greek stereotypes shown in the media. We looked at specifically how these stereotypes relate to Greek life and affect Greek life recruitment. Specifically, we looked at the TikTok and the Alabama rush trend that was trending back in August of 2021. Our research question was, what is the impact of Al Alabama rush TikTok on Greek life recruitment? So now we're going to look at the methodology. So our geographic information, demographic information is uh, college age students, both male and female, ranging from 18 to 22 years old. Our recruitment for participants was through our personal social media accounts, Facebook, and word of mouth. Our procedures, we conducted interviews for our research. We conducted a total of 12 interviews with an average time of 10 minutes. Our interviews were then transcribed through a transcription app called Otter. We used the thematic analysis to analyze our data. When developing our themes, we looked for repetition and keywords. So here is our uh, first theme. So we have stereotypes, um, which is the idea of someone's perception being altered or hindered in their own decision-making process of, dealing, of deciding to go Greek or not. We decided to break stereotypes into two different sections. And so the first section is um, through the common themes of philanthropy, commitment of service, and uh, co sense of community through brotherhood and sisterhood. So this example is, I was hoping that I would have more of a tight-knit group um, by joining a sorority from participant I. So some of the negative stereotypes uh, associated with Greek life is hazing, alcohol, drugs, sexual assault, personal demeanor, and entitlement. And so this example from participant F is, I think that the media portrays Greek life stereotypes with people that uh, party, drink, and get high. So this helps us to understand positive and negative stereotypes that surround Greek life on social media. Our second theme is social media networks and the common themes found were TikTok, Instagram, Yik Yak, Twitter, and YouTube. Participant E states, when I first started college, I would say Instagram changed my perception of Greek life the most, but now TikTok has impacted my opinion as well. The relevance of this is that it helps us understand what platforms are continuing to impact individuals' thoughts and opinions of Greek life. So our third theme is uh, physical appearance, and that is the idea of blonde, physically fit, white, and wealthy. So um, when looking at this, one of our participants, Kay, stated, I think of very bad spray tans and all of the girls looking the same. I also think of stereotypical skinny blonde girls with perfect hair, perfect nails, and looking the same as everyone else. I can't tell them apart. They have the same personality. So this helps us to understand the more commonly known stereotypes that are associated with Greek life and are still an issue today. Our last theme that we found was commitment, mainly time and money commitment, along with internal and external pressures. What we mean by internal pressure is the feeling that you have to fit the mold and dress or act a certain way to fit in. You put the pressure and commitment on yourself. External pressure is having pressure put on you by others to dress or act a certain way to fit in. Participant K said in their interview, sometimes I think I want to compare myself to people, but I shouldn't do this because I'm different and we're all different. This theme is relevant to our research topic because it helps us understand some of the drawbacks and concerns students have that cause them not to join Greek life. This research leads us to infer that physical appearance is a quality that makes students not want to join Greek life because they believe it can be too intimidating or they feel they do not meet the criteria. Philanthropy, commitment, and sense of community lead students to believe that they want to join a sorority or a fraternity because these are ways of belonging on campus and creating friendships with these Greek life members. Social media platforms have led students to believe certain things about Greek life. For instance, multiple interviewees claim to be against joining Greek life because they have seen partying, drinking, and drugs become an issue on social media. This is a negative setback to posting about Greek life on any platform. Some limitations that we faced during our research were we were unable to do any beta testing of our questions prior to our interviews. This meant that we weren't able to make any needed adjustments to the questions before conducting our interviews for clarity purposes. Another limitation that we faced was our female to male ratio. We were unable to get a lot of male interviews and ended up with only one male interviewee. This, this uneven male to female ratio led to interview opinions and perspectives being uneven. For future research, we recommend looking at a larger university for a greater sample size. 
We want to include comparing and contrasting fraternities and sororities because we need to understand the viewpoints of multiple organizations. Thank you so much for watching our presentation. Hi, my name is Rachel Abraham and these are my partners Landon and Alasia. Our topic this semester was mental health within student athletes in toxic environments. The objective of the study is to bring awareness to the overarching problem of both mental health within student athletes as well as toxic environments within college athletics. Toxic environments are defined in our study as environments that negatively impact and alter perceptions of oneself through physical and mental stressors. Uh, the research gaps that we found were that no previous research bridges between the gaps between poor mental health and toxic environments. Limited research conducted with participants at the collegiate level was also a gap that we found. Our research question was, how do toxic environments impact student athletes' mental health at the collegiate level? The participants for our study were Longwood student athletes. The recruitment procedures were an email was sent out to all active athletes at Longwood. The way that we conducted this were 12 interviews, averaged about four minutes long in length, and we used O transcribe to transcribe the data. Themes that were developed were repetition, keywords, and body language. Keywords that were used were student athlete, mental health, and Body language was also a large factor in our study. Okay, so talking about uh, the results that we found uh, and the themes, the first theme was hiding injuries, and one of our participants stated, I think so. I think if you have an injury, you kind of seem weak. So a lot of people work hard to cover them up. Uh, this is relevant because uh, this evidence supports previous research that uh, has shown that 
athletes have continued playing through injuries when they are not truly healthy. The second theme that we found was um, at affecting mental health. An uh, example of this would be, it's not good to hear your coaches talking bad about other players, and you hear it often. This is relevant because participants are conveying evidence about how they perceive mental health uh, has been affected. And the third and final theme that we found in our research was that mental health is un underrepresented. Um, one, of our one of our participants stated, I think the saddest part is people stress the importance of mental health and getting help and nothing's done about it. This is relevant because it provides a frame of reference of how athletes feel mental health is being underrepresented. And uh, this is within college athletic departments. So talking a little bit about uh, the discussion portion of our research, uh, the results of this research study gave us valuable information that supports the research question. And this is important due to the fact that the findings will show a correlation between mental health within student athletes and toxic environments, as well as better understand the cause of toxic environments to instill preventative strategies and also fill the gaps in previous literature about student athletes' mental health and how it is affected by toxic environments. So some of our limitations were um, one of our group members is a student athlete herself, which means that she's not allowed to be a point of contact, as well as there's a chance of bias. Uh, the next limitation is Longwood itself is a mid-major school. Uh, better schools have better resources, and also we have lower, lower level competition than them. And finally, volunteers. Um, most participants were from the same team, and they also had similar experiences all throughout. So when discussing the future research, we wanted to look into how can we better student athletes' mental health. So a way that we can do this is by improving college athletics. So by doing this, we can provide more research studies. So not only looking into one aspect of divisions, but all aspects of divisions, such as the NCAA, which is the National Collegiate Athletic Association, expanding to the NAIA, which is the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics. Considering our research study focused on a mid-major institution for future purposes researchers should expand its interviewing larger and well-known conferences around the world such as the big south tournament and more another way to look at future research is by supporting these findings so we wanted to raise awareness to combat change and instill preventive measures so we want to talk more and research more on the issues and the causes toxic environments can do to a student athlete's mental health by supporting these fi findings student athletes can have a better state of mind and can also be healthy Lastly, for future purposes, we wanted to expand in our participants, so not only focusing on current athletes, but also including former collegiate athletics, as well as interviewing incoming college athletics. In conclusion, we found multiple themes in our research study focusing on toxic environments and how they impact student athletes' mental health in a negative way. Athletes are hiding their injuries to not appear weak, and mental health is being in underrepresented in collegiate sports. The research shown is important and a problem in college athletics. Mental health is a growing issue in society today because of toxicity in the athlete's environment. We want to show that our research study may bring awareness to this underlying problem, but not only bring awareness, but also bring awareness to the problem that is constantly being overlooked. Thank you all for your time, and we will see you all again tomorrow morning at 11.30 a.m.
said friends in class never got picked last. Still, I feel like an outcast.